And I call the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to begin by thanking the member for Isaacs for his brevity. Uh, and uh, as a neighbouring member of parliament, uh, it's always uh, good to get his views on the record, particularly on a matter as important as this. Speaker, uh, as somebody uh, in my former role who spent some time working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, including my good friend, the old Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner Mick Gooder, particularly around the challenges facing the use of land under native title for uh, economic development uh, and having convened round tables and broom in Sydney on some of the challenges that are faced in this space to realise the economic potential of land. Um, this bill is very welcome because, of course, not just with prescribed body corporates but Indigenous land corporations play a critical and important part of the infrastructure that sits around the use of uh, uh, native title lands and uh, the legacy of the Mabo decision. Uh, and, of course, state-based regimes, as well as the particular issues around uh, title in the Northern Territory. And what we actually want is an environment where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are able to fully realise their ambitions and their dreams based on the assets that are available to them. And what we have uh, in, uh, in some of the ILCs uh, is an acquisition program of land for up to $2 billion, uh, which enables to be used for effective purpose to advance the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live with the consequences and adjustment of displacement that came as a consequence of European settlement. We cannot undo the legacy of the past. What we can do is choose a future and a better future for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But more critically, it doesn't actually matter what we, being the people who are in this place right now in this chamber or in the Senate, think, because the pathway for success for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is not for what we can impose on them or do to them. The pathway to success for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is what we can do to empower and support them to realise their own ambitions and their own dreams. What we want. I would have thought is for more, ab more people to take ownership, for people to feel like they are in control of their future, and for them to be able to take that control, that sense of ownership, and translate it into better outcomes, not just for themselves, but for generations yet to come. Because when it comes <clears throat> to generations yet to come, what we have to do is break the cycle of what has occurred in the past, where many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have felt that this country has not served them, where this country has simply, in its modern form, uh, sought to uh, alienate or isolate or displace their traditions, their culture, their language and, of course, their land. And yesterday, Deputy Speaker, I spoke uh, in this place on another bill related to some of the housing measures that this government is investing in as part of a framework working with the states. And I made the point at the time, Deputy Speaker, uh, Speaker, that despite how we sometimes think about the transactional nature of housing, and it's an important part of it, we have a market in housing, it needs to be supported, and a private market that works successfully for the most part, but doesn't meet everybody's needs because of people's economic circumstances and sometimes the constraints we place on it, which makes it beyond uh, the reach of many people who would otherwise seek to rely upon it, is that without a house, but more critically without a home, is the bedrock of stability of people's lives, there are huge consequences for how people then go on to live their lives. It's a truism and a statement of the bleeding obvious. But in practice, we take it for granted. If people don't have that bedrock of their life, that foundational stone of a home, they can't then go on and achieve so much of what is, frankly, the habit of life. We all have lived experience when we come into this parliament, Speaker. Um, it's not reserved for me. It's not reserved for those on the other side or this side or even yourself. It is the lived experience, and part of the reason why we stand here is because we have succeeded in harnessing the potential that's available to us. And that's off the back of routine, of stability, and then the capacity to use that to leverage 
to a more successful life, including, frankly, the confidence to put yourself out into the public and have your ideas, your values and your confidence tested against a community and ultimately the scrutiny of the Australian people. And the story is no different for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. When you sever a connection between a people and the place they call home, particularly when the connection is more than just a transactional relationship around what is owned at a time, but what is seen as being custodian and enduring custodianship, as connected directly to a place and a home and a culture and a language that in people's mindsets brings them a sense of safety. The consequences are quite severe. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are not alone in this. Uh, there are many other cultures around the world who have similar journeys and similar challenges uh, and countries that continue to face the consequences of that. And that's why taking simple and practical measures to redress the legacy of that severed connection is so critical as part of rebuilding that sense of place. And so, as I said, this bill is designed to enable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and their land account, um, uh, which funds the ILCs, to be able to be used for as constructive a purpose as possible, because while we might capitalise the basis of that ownership and that heritage um, in financial resources to be able to go on and do things into the future, what we have to do is make sure that it's sustainable and that no money is wasted. And so part of the reform of this government, a very pragmatic reform, is to recognise that the place for such funds is with the future fund, not because we wish to control it, but simply because of the capacity to deliver returns to provide that basis for a sustainable future for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the ILCs to be able to secure the funding that they need. We've done exactly the same thing, and this is where I think it's important to draw the parallel. We've done the same thing for unfunded superannua or, uh, uh, superannuation liabilities for public servants under the Future Fund for this place and this modern structure. And in doing so, we're setting a standard from which we're able to hold against ourselves but also for others. And the ambition now for the Future Fund should not just be to hold the capital that's available to them to be able to do what is right and meet the expectations and the obligations that set out in their charter and their course, but also to generate the income and the potential so that we can help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people thrive. And so it's on that basis, that very simple, pragmatic basis, that I support this piece of legislation. It follows, as the uh, Attorney General and Shadow Attorney General have outlined, uh, includes a long process of consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people so that they are working or we are working with them more critically, so that we are designing laws and regulations that meet their needs, but more critically so that there's a trust that is being built between uh, those who are custodians uh, of this wealth uh, and of course the people who seek to govern it, so that we may have a better future and a shared future together. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Speaker.